Hey everybody, welcome to Shed I Love with Jason Stewart, that's me, and my guest, my really dear friend, Alison Angram. A lot of you know her from uh, playing uh, Nellie Olson on Little House on the Prairie, and from her independent films, her book on the New York Times bestseller list, it's now an audio and paperback, and uh, I guess also your touring show that you've been touring with for almost 20 years, I'm guessing, right? Well, I guess, well, 2000, uh, um, yeah, it started in... 2002, but sort of became what it is in like 2006 ish. Uh -huh. And so, yeah. I remember like, seeing uh, it at the uh, Lily Tom and Jane Wagner yes, Theater. Yes, yes. I came like when you first did it. I've that's seen like I think, your first three, animated video and it was born. And Sue, three incarnations uh, I've seen. Sue Hamilton uh, at the Game Lesbian Center workshopped this whole thing with me where she's, I mean, <laughs> is there video in this show? No. Could there be? Yes, there could. And suddenly, kablooey, we had what became. Confessions of a Prairie Bitch. The show. And we met, uh, God, I hate to in say. In 10,000 BC. Yes, it was. we met in the 80s at the Laugh Factory. Mm -hmm. when you, like the early 80s, like almost the 70s. Uh, was it that long? I started comedy in 83, so I guess. It was I, 83. Yeah, and I met you when you were sort of segueing from being a child star yep. to being an, a comedian. Indeed. And you were working at the Laugh Factory, and you were really yes. nice, and you were married to this cute little boy band boy. <laughs> Or you had I was not married, thank the Lord, living with. Yes, I yes. escaped that one without paperwork. Yes. Did you, never, <laughs> did you never marry him? No. I thought you married him. No, I married another guy and then divorced him. Oh, now that was I'm, the other. But he was also a cute boy back then. Yeah, they, they, were all, they were all adorable. And, yes. And, 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 and no use as husbands. No. And then you married the most lovely man. And then I married Bob. The Bob. Sword. Yes. 25 years this boy. And he is, could not be more different. He looks like... Uh, he looks like he has a rock band, which he does. Which he does. And he looks like a, an old hippie, which he does. And he so, looks like he probably smokes an incredible amount of dope, right? which he I, doesn't. I, I had I had a picture of him up on Instagram, and someone said, my God, he looks like Maurice Gibb. Uh, he looks like the lost Yes, Bee Gees. he does. <laughs> he could be one of the Bee Gees. Yes, he's yeah, the he's lost got, Bee Gees. But he's a lot more put, put together than... Uh, than yeah, you know, because yeah. Because he has... Oh, God, Barry hasn't aged as well as I thought he would. Now, yeah, Bob's really holding it together well. We're I amazed. think so. He's I aged think beautifully. So. And we were talking, you were going to tell me this story about, we, we just got here. But. Oh my God, we were talking about, because, hi, we're actors, and we were talking about all the kooky competition and resentment and people who are like, eh, well, you got a show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah let's, let's be really clear about that. We were talking about, I have a lot of um, empathy for people mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Who, who, uh, are, who are angry. And who didn't get what they wanted. I do because I think sometimes you just, it's really hard to understand. It's hard and it's frustrating. It's very this difficult. It's very frustrating. It's very, very frustrating. And it's not for everybody. No, 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 no. And it's okay to say, hey, I don't want to do this anymore and to do something else. It really is. And there is a human compulsion, and especially people in this business, to sort of freak out when they're friends, even when it's someone they really like, does well. They don't mean to be awful. Not freak out. I always say to be envious, not jealous. Envious. It's a kooky thing, but I've seen it so much because I'm Hello, I got a national TV show when I was freaking 12. Right. So I wound up on Little House at 12, and Tell I... Tell people who don't know the show well, you, who you play. For those of you who don't know, in the 1970s, back in the other century, there was a marvelous television show called Little House on the Prairie, based on the books of Laura Ingalls Wilder. And it Slower, ran from so they can all hear 1974 yeah. through 1983, which is a wonderfully long time to do anything. You were on there for nine years? I was on for seven, and then I came back in season nine for a special guest star thing because uh -huh. they because I left at the end of my seven year contract and then it was like oh god could you just please come back for an episode um just people like begging to have me back it was awesome right because you were the nemesis because I was evil and terrible and wonderful and I was the villain and it was so much fun I can't even stand it it was great um because if you watch the show Laura was the very good girl and the lovely family with Michael Lennon and Melissa's and sweet and Melissa's a lot more you know what's interesting is about the person that plays the accessible lead in a show is usually someone who's a little more reserved and a right. little more come mm -hmm. to me and melissa is a more when i've met her mm -hmm. uh, on occasion she's not somebody it's not that she isn't warm she isn't somebody that reaches out to people more come to her well, right and then the melissa Swanderson, whereas you're the exact opposite and then melissa Swanderson who played mary who's just this this saint on the show she's like yeah melissa, what was the other Swanderson, one? Swanderson, gorgeous girl played mary very, very distant sweet. and a little absolutely she's like oh god please go away just all like just leave me alone i can't stand it she's shy yes. as anything whereas right? the one who played the most awful person horrible Awful, stuck-up, stand-up girl telling everyone, no, I mean, just the Betty Davis of the Prairie. And I'm like, hi! <laughs> right, I just want to hang out with you and 
do some jokes and have a corn yeah, dog. Yeah, it's just, it's opposite day. All but it the always day. is it like is. that. It's Even always, always. On Birth of a Nation, all three or four right. villains are all liberal, cool, the nicest, nicest guys. guys. Yeah, the evil slave owners in Birth of a Nation yes. are like, oh, hi. All of, all of us, though. <laughs> all of us. It's crazy. Everyone yeah. I know has ever played any way, in any way a decent villain is always like super nice. And the people that play the leads who are gorgeous mm. are a little more remote. Yeah, it's, it's always the way. But see, I had the thing, because I got this show at 12 and became horribly famous by like 13. Um, I experienced it then. And it was a shock then. But in adulthood, then like we're talking about like when my book came out. Cause I, I wrote a book about being a child star and growing up in Hollywood and having a crazy family. But I got to tell people, TV. and I got to say this, the book is so much more than yeah. that. It really is, because you had a father who was a manager who was in showbiz. Your mother was a famous animation star. And my father was gay. Your father was gay. And, and all these crazy things went on. And, and there, were, there were some very heavy things, right? too, about molestation. I mean, I'm not speaking and, and then term. about And about Steve Tracy dying the babies and, about, and, about and everything. Who, who we knew individually right. out of weirdness. And it, it's business. confessions of a prairie bitch, how I survived Nellie Olson and learned to love being hated. And yes, hardcover, paperback, Kindle, and audiobook were so graphic. But, okay, when the book came out, I even warned Bob, my husband, I said, okay, man, you know when this book comes out, because it was okay, I said... You can talk a little slower, because we're going to be here for a while. Okay, because so I like... Bruh, bruh. So, yes, I want people to actually understand I the warned, actual words. I warned Bob, all of those of you in New York can translate for everyone else. Um, I write. All right. <laughs> well, actually, when the book comes out, okay, our close friends are going to go, well, that's awesome, and that's great, and they're going to come to the book signing and the party, and they're going to go, cool, you have a book, it's great. And I said, and there's going to be a small group of people. And I said, you can't really predict. I said, maybe if you brought in like a team of psychiatrists. I said, but you won't necessarily be able to predict who it's going to be. But there will be a couple of people in our pool of friends who are going to get so weird. Who instead of saying, oh, wow, that's great. Yes, I'm coming to the party. Are going to go, oh, oh, so your book's in the New York Times bestseller list. And, and I'm whispering a name to you. Yeah. <laughs> like, Am I right? I, I, I didn't say, I don't read oh, you lips. Can't, I, mean, I do not read lips. You're like whispering, who, who? No, no, no. She's oh, okay. happy. She's happy. Oh, okay. But right, you see, but there you go. But not for me. You never know who it's going to be. She sort of dropped me for a while. And the, people are going, who's that? I'm not never talking. We're not going, we're not going to talk. The damnedest people. It's will, never been the same since, the, since that. Right, right, and that's what it is. And there's been, there were a couple of people, and Bob and I were sort of amazed, because people we thought, might be envious or feel put out. We're like, wow. See, I'm, I'm so the opposite. Happy. I want to build you up, and I want to go hang with you, and I want to. See, you you have my attitude. Rising tide floats all boats. Oh yeah. If somebody has hit it and made it successful and done something wonderful, then oh, okay, there's more coming in the pipeline for us all. Well, that's the way I think it. What more fun is it? How many? How hard have I tried to work to you to get you into my stuff? But right. But you're, you're never available. But you know. <laughs> but oh, it's. We finally did that thing in, in, in uh, Seattle. We did the horror, thing. where you're technically my father. Yes. It's it, brilliant. It's what's called it's, the Manifesto. It's, it's Mephisto bo box, box, and I think they're calling it To Suffer a Witch or something now. Who knows? But Really? Yeah, I think they changed the name. They got like, they, they trying to get a distribution deal, and I think they changed no the name. No one's told I me. Know. I know, I can't keep up with these things. I'll let you. But it's it's awesome. I kill it was a, a web series that was done on YouTube. I kill a lot of people. I'm kind of a reluctant Satanist. I'm trying to get away from the cult. They won't let me. I just, I, they had to come and I had to kill them. And I thought, I have to say, you were really great in it. I loved it. I had so much fun doing it. It was very freeing because I'm in a wig and a thing and a knife and dead rats. And it was all so bizarre and off the wall and crazy. It was like, as an actor, I said, okay, all bets are off. All rules are out the window. It doesn't, I could do, I could do anything. I, did, I could do absolutely anything in this role and it would somehow work. I just did whatever he told me to do. Yes. I just, it was very freeing. He said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this. I'm like, sure. Wh why not? And then I look at the tape and I'm like. It's Kelly Hughes is the writer, yeah. producer, director, and he's sort of a, uh, um, Seattle's John Waters. Right, exactly. He had like a weird horror cable channel, like sometimes. I, I just went, well, well, what the heck? What the heck have I got to lose? And now I look at it and go, this is great stuff. And you are this sort of Alistair Go Crowley... Um, guru. 
of yeah. sorts. I'm like a you're the cult James leader. Jones or Jim Jones. And you're really scary. And there's these videos. Am I? Yes. You're at this video of you go, embrace the chaos. It's I love it. You know what's so funny is did I tell you what happened when I did it? He, no, he you're a 12, scary. it's great. He said he said there's here's the dialogue, it's very little. And then and he sent it to me and then he said and then we did it. He said it'll be a lot of improv. And then he said when he got there, he says, here's twelve pages. Just learn this. And this was the night before. Just learn this. And I said, you want me to learn 12 pages of dialogue just in one evening? I said, this is never going to happen. <laughs> so I said, what you, what I'll, just put it on cue cards and I'll be able to read it. And I did. And I did each one separately. Fabulous. And I, I just, and I just did it, you know, because the character is reading off these things. He's, he's doing his own little right. private thing. So it really worked. And it really worked. Really, really worked really well. And I wore this weird outfit and these glasses. And, and I got pages before, but then I got there and he said, well, okay, we're doing this dialogue, but then this whole scene is no dialogue. It's you and you're performing a ritual and then you're in the forest and then you set a fire and then you're going to do this. And it was just all this non-dialogue, completely insane stuff. And it's like, well, I changed my mind. We're going to have you hide behind a tree. And he's like, we're like just making stuff up. And I had the, the thing and the wig. And now you wear this wig or this. And you look so young in it, too. So marvelous. I had the false eyelashes and this like 1960s model gone wrong wig, um, which I styled that wig myself. I'm very proud to say. Yes. Yeah, so you look very, very Jennifer um, Jennifer in Valley of the Dolls. Yes. And then, and then I get very stabby. And so we came in and I just thought, well, this is just go with it. This is just go with it kind of thing. And I went with it and I got so out of myself and into this zone that I went, well, I'm not sure quite what I did just now, but I think it was good. And then I watched it and went, this is, this is fantastic. It's funny. It's the best it's thing It's funny ever. and campy, it's but it's also scary. It's very, the, the little trailer he made, I had friends in France who were like, okay, I was terrified by the trailer. What the mm -hmm. heck is going on in that thing? So yeah, and so you're, like you're my dad. You're, you're the head of the cult and I, I'm your long lost daughter who, and then I, I'm trying to get away, but then I watched the video and I am pulled in back into the cult just from watching you scream well, embrace you know. the chaos. <laughs> So tell me about, so you tell me about the book and we'll go back to what we were talking about. Yeah, it, it was weird because when my, my, fa my fabulous pink book, uh, uh, Confessions of a Prairie Bitch, came out, which did go to the New York Times bestseller list, number 30. For how right. long? Like three weeks. Wow. It was good. And it was like 30 and 31. It's but not good. It's, it's incredible. It's fantastic. The odds of that book come I, on. Look, like, there's a million, a million bazillion books come out every week. Has your book ever been read in any of these celebrity biography things? No, and I wish I, I I should call them and say here have a do it because they do it in New York. I would love I guess I would love that, but they have not. Um, but it came out and about you and other people were like this is great, fabulous. But there were I remember going to the uh, book party you came, exactly, you came and Rose party. Marie was there and Rose Marie <laughs> and then all our friends and it was like it was like yeah it was crazy and Tippy Hedren and Gloria Allred had yes, cocktails but, together. Yes. It was just like what where who yeah. uh, the strangest I forgot about friends that. showed up those things. Gloria's terrific. Some though. people were a small group were awed and were so freaked out and and behaving. He said, well, you're not going to talk to us anymore because you're successful. And I had to warn Bob. I said, some write of your friends. Down. I just wanted to write a name well, down. <laughs> I won't um, say it out loud. No, no, no. They, and they got weird. There was a couple of his friends. And I said, you oh. won't know. It'll be the oddest people will get weird on you. And then other people you think are going to get weird on you will not get weird on you. It's, it's no rhyme or reason. And I had this happen when I was 12, when I got Little House. We're all told that, okay, if you get rich or famous or something near a show, you'll have fake friends who have people sucking up to you, want to be your friends. Uh, I don't mind that. <laughs> right? It's like, sure, we'll take the friends. You know, but then, then you realize, I, I honestly don't mind it. And then you realize after a while, okay, they, they get it pa if they can get past it, and then you think, okay, do you really want to be friends? Sometimes they turn out to, yeah, to be okay. They just, it just, I, people forget that it is a weird thing. But and and, it, and you, when you see somebody and you... you love what they do and then you don't really know them and you don't know them at all and then sometimes you, sometimes you connect and sometimes you don't. Sometimes it turns out you're meant to be friends but what they warn you that that's going to happen. They don't really warn you that some of your friends will like shun you because they see you as more successful than them. You will be shunned for doing the right thing and that's weird because you go, wait, I it thought people would suck up. Why are these people? I had a, when I, I turned I said a little house, which well, there were several people just stopped speaking to me, and then I had like a teacher totally suck up to me, and I was like, "Wow, you're like a grown person." Geez, that's kind of sad. Um, and then I was 18, I like got my trust fund, and 
I thought, oh, I'm going to have everybody hang around my living room now because they're going to hear I have cash. Did they know? How do people know? Oh, it was all over town. But no. Did they know? No. It was like ghost town. People bailed. They were like, oh, well, she got her trust fund and has money. So let's not talk to her. And I was like, oh, okay, that's weird. I didn't realize there were so many things. And it's so odd. And then so I knew this was going to say, well, there'll probably be some people who will bail because I wrote a book, which will be odd. And luckily it was very few, but I, I warned Bob, I said, you will be shocked at the people who are can't deal and aren't happy for you, which is weird. Now, but I feel most like, of my I, friends are yeah. like it. Most of my friends But I feel like when I all... met you, I didn't really, I wasn't a little house person. No, I didn't no, you knew, and you knew me as me. You knew I me knew as, as you, me. I knew as, you, as yeah. a comedian also, so as a fellow comedian. I knew, and I knew who you were, but, but you, I didn't, it didn't. Uh... You have the attitude, if someone got something good, that just means, see, there's people in California who But talk I also about, just liked you right off. And you like me. But there, but in California, don't you have a lot of people who talk about, oh, the abundance in the universe and the thing, uh -huh. the infinite, the, and usually they're like the first ones to like completely freak out and become jealous and envious. But there actually is this abundance in the universe, and if someone actually, something good happens, it, it's great. It is rising tide floats all boats. And what was it like no for you? What was it like for you when you started doing stand-up and all of a sudden it wasn't what you thought it was going to be and then you you we were talking about which i thought was really neat is you when you started doing stand-up you did it for a while and you realized this is not my path i'm going to create my own path yep yep yep. because um, cause you were not the usual kind of stand-up at the time i think now your stand-up would be much more uh in keeping with what's going on uh -huh, now. Uh -huh. And then it was joke, 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 it's a joke. Little like, it's a little like when what Beth Lapidus talks about why she formed on Cabaret. Right. She wasn't seeing a place for people to tell stories. Because back in the oldie, oldie days, you know, Bob Newhart and George Carlin and whatnot could oh. get up at a coffee house and go once upon a time, and they could sit there and tell a freaking story all night, and nobody mm -hmm. minded. And then by the 70s and early 80s, it was bang, 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 bang. And you had this, like, gimmicks. Well, the, se the 70s and... really became the stand-up comic era. That was it. It was like, yeah. like well, like the, the book about the comedy store and everything. I'm dying up here. Yeah, and I'm I'm in that, and it's like, are you? Oh, yeah, heavens to Betsy, photos and everything. Really? Yeah, it's sort of like a, writing a book about rock and roll in the '60s and saying, yeah, I played you know bass for somebody at Woodstock. I'm one of those people, and so I, I didn't know that. Book. I didn't. What did they book. say about you? Um, they interviewed me and talked about how I mean, here I was like 15 hanging out at the comedy store and there was the big strike and I was here I was all these people in their 20s and 30s who came to LA became stand-up comics in the hopes of getting on TV. And here I was, essentially, this teenage kid who was already on a successful TV show trying to break into stand-up comedy. And all these people are doing comedy going, I'm trying to get on a freaking show. You're already on a show. Why are you taking my set time? It really and, was a strange order. And it was very weird. And they, most of them were from out of town. And he, he said it was like the college kids in the townies. And here you are. You're already here. And you're on a show. And you're... Freaking so, 16. He said, how bizarre was that whole dynamic? And I was like, oh, completely. It was. There were people I became great friends with, but there were also people like, why are you even here? And it was, it was Also because of your age, too. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. And so I was doing, so, and it was, it was very joke, 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 joke. And it, it was satisfying, but not satisfying. There were times that I did very well and I killed and I enjoyed exactly. it enormously. But then I was like, I mean, isn't that, that's, I'd love to tell the story about it. And it was this joke. And then in the you 80s. You couldn't, you couldn't really find your own, you can use your own voice. Yeah. And then, you, were using, you had to use a voice that, it, because the style was very, very specific at that time. And comedy does go through those things. Totally where, goes through fashions. And yeah. Beth Lapidus talked about how in the 80s, there was an era, things got kind of meaner. There was that kind of, well, the people, the, the Andrew Dice Clay wannabes. Right. And the people who would do these shows where they would often be racist or homophobic. It or got sexist really filthy. Yeah, and they would say, like, terrible things. And she said, okay, so what happens to all the women, all the gay comics, all the lesbian comics, all the comics of color, all the comics who just don't happen to be doing, like, insult humor at the moment and aren't 